hello everybody welcome to my youtube channel welcome to my youtube channel shirley's channel chatter so um i have uh, three channels here on youtube so i have three uh youtube channels all going to be all three of them will be business related so marketing advertising promoting different things like that total quality management continuous improvement, comparative advantage. I might talk about a little bit of law, a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of business, a little bit of law, a little bit of um, accounting, uh, and also wanted to, um, you know, share some light on some, you know, different individuals that I learned about in my past, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of individuals I learned about in my past, and, uh, my past, you know, the time that I had at Australia University. So, um, Abraham Marshall, um, John Locke, uh, Henry David Thoreau, uh, Socrates, Plato, um, Rembrandt, Michelangelo, um, uh, th probably Thomas Jefferson, uh, you know, different presidents. I want to talk about, you know, slavery, everything, everything I can talk about, you know, and um, you know that that's related to our history when it comes to you know learning. So I want to start out with a gentleman named Abraham Maslow. So Abraham Maslow, uh, my glasses. So Abraham Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. So let's start out with Abraham Maslow. Abraham Maslow, Maslow, it's probably safe to say that the most well-known theory of motivation is Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So he, uh, Abraham Maslow had um, five hierarchy of needs, five hierarchy of needs. So the first one he has is the physiological, then he has the safety needs, the social needs, the esteem needs, and the self-actualization needs. So Abraham Maslow felt that when you satisfy one need, then you move down to the next need and satisfy the next need. So the first need, the physiological, includes hunger, uh, thirst, shelter, and other bodily needs. Uh, anything related to the body that you need would be physiological. So your physical, I guess your outer uh, physical appearance, uh, things that you need to keep your body healthy. Uh, then you have your safety needs, which include security, uh, protection from physical and emotional uh, harm. And then he has the social needs. So uh, social needs include affection, belongingness, uh, people, everybody, we all wants to feel, we all want to feel that we belong uh, somewhere in life, you know. We have our mothers, we have our fathers, we have our cousins, uncles, aunts. Uh, we might have a best friend, a godmother. Uh, we all want to feel that we belong with them, we belong to them, that they care about us, that they love us, and we love them. Uh, so then we have the, so we have the physiological, the safety, the social, uh, the esteem, and then we have the self-actualization. So uh, the esteem needs, uh, is, the esteem needs includes internal esteem factors uh, such as self-respect, autonomy, and achievement. And then we have the external esteem factors such as status, recognition, and attention. And then self-actualization, uh, the drive to become what is what one is capable of be, of becoming. Includes growth, achieving, achieving one's potential, and self fulfillment. So, in other words, you satisfy one need, then you move on to the next need and try to satisfy that one. It says, as each of these needs become substantially satisfied, the next need becomes dominant. The next need becomes dominant. So, you satisfy one need, then you move to the next need, and then the next need becomes dominant. So, one need after the next. It says, uh, Maslow's need theory has received wide recognition, particularly among practicing managers. So, so um, Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs is, is definitely 
well, back then when I was in college, you know, Australia University, uh, managers needed uh, to, you know, make use of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I assume that today is probably the same, uh, you know, the, the managers probably still using, uh, implementing this uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So uh, they said Maslow's need theory has received wide recognition, uh, uh, particularly among practicing managers. Uh, this, this can be attributed to the theory's intuitive logic and ease of understanding. Uh, Maslow provided no empirical substantiation and several studies that sought to validate the theory found no support for it. Some people might, you know, it's the same with everything. Some people might be for it, for it and some people might be against it. It's like anything, like YouTube. Some people might be for YouTube, you know, for us creating their own channels. Because I have, I have friends that say, hey, I don't want to be on social media. I don't want to be on YouTube. I don't want to be on TikTok. So I told them, you know, I said, well, teach his own. I like it. It's fun. And, you know, it's, it's a social platform. It's a social platform, you know. So you can meet people and, you know, they can meet you. You can meet people and just friend, you know. Use it as a friend zone. Use it, if we use social media uh, as a platform for, um, you know, you know, some people run their businesses on here. Um, you meet friends, people look for a date, uh, people looking for a hu husband, people looking for a wife. I mean, whatever your needs are here on social media, then it's here for the taking. But like I said, some people don't like social media, some people don't want no TikTok, some people don't want no Instagram, no Facebook, and then that is their right, you know, that's their right. So I said, old theories, especially ones that are intuitively logical, uh, apparently die, die hard. Uh, one researcher viewed the evidence and concluded that although, although of great so, uh, societal popularity, uh, need hierarchy uh, as, a, as a theory continues to receive little empirical support. So in other words, when he came up with this, uh, you know, Maslow, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, he already, you know, because in everything you do, you always, nine times out of ten, you're going to find some critics, you're going to find some haters, you're going to find people that's against it, but, you know, if, do what you want to do, so... Do what you want to do in life. So that's what it's all about. Further, the researchers stated that the available research should certainly generate a reluctant, reluctance of acceptance unconditionally uh, the implication of Maslow's hierarchy. Another review came to the same conclusion. Little support was found for the prediction that need structures are organized along the dimensions proposed by Maslow, that unsatisfied needs motivate or that a satisfied need activates movement to a new to a new need level so in other words they're saying that some people didn't believe that uh one one need after you meet one need then you you know then you satisfy yourself with the next need so some people didn't believe that that would be an effective way to uh you know, to make them whole, to make them feel that it's, that it's needed, make them feel that it's, that it's, uh, it can help, you know, and it can help them within their life. And it says Maslow, it says, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. In other words, it says another, in other words, this was a review. Another review came to the same conclusion. Little support was found for the prediction that need structures are organized along the dimensions proposed by Maslow. So they didn't feel that the needs, the way, they didn't feel that the way Abraham Maslow structured, structured those needs didn't feel that, didn't feel that they were, um, I guess, effective. You know, they, they didn't see a need for it. They didn't have no benefit for it. So then we have another gentleman. So let me see if uh, Abraham Maslow, let me see uh, some quotes before I move on to the next uh, gentleman. Okay, Abraham Maslow's quotes. Uh, what is necessary to change a person is to change his awareness of himself. 
So what is necessary to change a person is to change his awareness of himself. So in other words, you have to change. He felt that Abraham Oslo felt that you uh, should change. You should change. So what is necessary to change a person? So in other words, to change you as a person, you need to change your awareness of your, yourself. So in other words, change your awareness. In other words, you could be, I mean, I think he meant like, uh, you know, be aware. Be aware of your surroundings. Be aware of negativity. Be aware of positivity. Be aware of things that can benefit you in your life. So in other words, what is necessary to change a person is to change his awareness of himself. So change the awareness of yourself. It could, that can make you look uh, at life differently, look at yourself differently. When you look within yourself and you say, I've been through this problem, I've been through this, I've been through that. So if you've been through a lot and, it, and sometimes that does make you aware about certain other issues. So in other words, I know I, can, I heard people say, you know, I've been through this and I've been through that. That makes me more, uh, that makes me more aware of things like that that could happen. Things like that, since I've been through that on this level, I've been through that on this level, that does make me aware, that does raise my awareness on things that, something like that, you know, things like that happening. Uh, you know, things might happen again. You might have a problem, something may happen, and it does raise your awareness. And then it raises your trust level as, as well. Uh, so it says what is necessary to change a person is to change his awareness of himself. So you can have to change, so in other words, change your awareness of, your, of yourself. I would say you can change, I would say change your awareness of, uh, you know, society as a whole. That's what I would say. I mean, you can change your awareness of yourself as well because, uh, it, I mean, I, I assume that he means that, in other words, change your awareness uh, of, of yourself. So in other words, are, what, you know, are you aware that this can happen, that can happen? Are you aware that since you, uh, you did this and you did that, then that, you know, that makes you aware of certain other things you know, things that might be on a lower level or higher level. And it says uh, if you plan on being anything less than you are capable of being, you will probably be unhappy all the days of your life. Now, if you plan on being anything less than you are capable of being, so in other words, don't be less than what you're capable of being is what he's saying. If you plan on being anything capable of what, what you, what, uh, if you, if you plan on being anything less than you are capable of, <clears throat> if you plan on being anything less than you are capable of being, you will probably be unhappy all the days of your life. So in other words, uh, I assume he's saying, uh, don't think low of yourself, you know. In other words, if you think, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that, you know. In other words, in other words you want to go to college, you want to have a family, you want to get married. I mean, so many things, positive things that you want to do. If you don't think about yourself for uh, making it to that level or, you know, you say, oh, shoot, I'm poor right now. And, you know, if you, if you, if you think less of yourself, say, oh, I'm poor, I'll never be nothing, I'll never have nothing, I'll never go to college, I'll never, I'm trying to make a million dollars one day. But if you don't think those things for yourself and, you know, you have to put your foot down and say, hey, I am going to make something of my life. I'm going to strive and work. I'm going to climb that ladder. And I'm going to do what I need to do. Because so if you plan on being anything less than you are capable. So you don't be, so in other words, he's saying, if you plan on being anything less than you are capable. In other words, you might be capable of working for a big corporation. But if you don't plan on trying to strive for that, then you'll be miserable the rest of your life. So that's what he's saying. You'll be probably unhappy all the days of your life. So in other words, you want to, you know, you want to, you want to, you know, what if you say, hey, I want to, I wouldn't mind having a big time corporate job or, you know, I want to go to college. I want to, you know, make those grades. I want to run my own business. 
Uh, if you think those high things of yourself, running your own business, uh, working for maybe another corporation, uh, buying a nice house, buying a uh, beautiful car, but if you think, in other words, if you think less of yourself and you think, well, hey, I, I can't, you know, I will never achieve those things, that means he's saying that if you, if you think that you are not capable of doing those type of things, then you'll probably be miserable your whole life. You'll be unhappy. See, if you plan on being anything less than you are capable. So in other words, don't, he's saying don't be, I guess in a, in a sense he's saying don't be, uh, don't be less, don't be less than what you are capable of uh, being or doing. So in other words, we all are capable of, uh, my opinion, we all are capable, opportunities are out there for all of us. So if we think that we, uh, if we're thinking less of ourselves, and we, we figure, hey, we can't, you know, we cap you're capable, but, you know, you're thinking less of yourself. You don't think you're capable of, you know, achieving that, achieving those, uh, those higher, you know, higher goals. What a man can be. He must be. What a man can be, he must be. What a man can be, he must be. In other words, what a man can be, a man can probably be anything he wants to be. A man can be anything he wants to be. A woman can be anything she wants to be. So what it says, what a man can be, he must be. I, I assume that it's the same as uh, what a woman can be, uh, she can be. So in other words, you can be... You can be what you want to be. You can be your dream, you know, your hopes and your dreams, your aspirations. Whatever you want to be, opportunities are out there. And um, so in other words, also he's saying that if you, uh, in other words, don't downplay your capabilities. You know, that was the, the quote that I read previously. Don't downplay your capabilities. It says if you plan on being anything less than you are capable, so don't downplay your capabilities. We all are human beings. We are all capable of much more than we, we you know, much more than we, we think we are capable of. We definitely more capable of, but the thing is, don't think that you're not capable. Just try, you know, just try. If you only have a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. If you only have a ham, hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. So don't quite understand that one. If you only have a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. So in other words, if you only have a hammer, in other words, you only have that one tool. So in other words, he's saying if you only have a hammer, that means if you only have that one tool to do what you need to do in life, then you're gonna see, then you tend to see every problem as a nail. So in other words, you tend to see every problem. In other words, you see these problems, but you only have one ha In other words, you said you only have a hammer. To me, I take from that to say that uh, if you only have a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. So if you only have a hammer, that means you only have one, you only have one tool to do what you need to do. One tool, which will be the hammer. So, you, so in, other, in other words, you only have that hammer. You only have that one tool, that one instrument. And if you only have that one thing, because you might, in other words, you might have a big old problem, but you can't solve the problem because you don't have enough, you don't have enough uh, tools, you know, to solve that problem. And that's, that's what I think he's saying. You tend to see every problem as a nail. So a nail is like, uh, I guess a nail would be something hard. That's what it seems like to me, he's saying. If you only have a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. So in other words, you have a, you have a hammer, which is one hammer is just one tool. So what if you have a, you know, you got a problem, you, you need, you need so much to put together to solve that problem. But if you only have that hammer, which is uh, that one, tool or one instrument and in other words you got that you have that big problem but you don't have enough things to fight that big problem so but you tend to see every problem as a nail so in other words you're seeing every problem as 
large, widespread, but you only have, you don't have enough, you don't have enough uh, to, you know, to, to solve the problem. You only have one hammer, one hammer, and according to this quote, one hammer would not be enough. One hammer would not be enough because you, cause you think, well, all I have is this, this is a big problem, and all I have is this one hammer, this one tool, this one instrument to solve this big problem over here. So then I'm thinking about since I only have that one instrument, which is that hammer to solve this large problem that I have, I'm thinking about the problem is so large, it's, it's just like a nail, and a nail is very hard. So that is, so let me see what other quotes here. Now I tried to explain, I tried to, you know, take those quotes and, you know, just to understand uh, the meaning through, you know, the way I see it, you know, when I read a quote, you know, the way I see it, if, you know, the way I understand the quote to mean to me, you know, it says, uh, Abraham Maslow, if you plan on being, okay, I just read this one, if you plan on being anything less than you are capable of being, you will probably be unhappy all the days of your life. Let's see what else he got. The ability to be, let's see, the ability, the ability to be in the present moment is a major component of mental wellness. The ability to be in the present moment is a major component of mental wellness. So the ability to be in the present moment, so I guess that I take that to say that uh, the ability to be, the ability to be mentally stable in you know reality, you know the the, uh, the ability to be in the present moment. So you in that moment, you're not you know, and not thinking about you're not thinking about nothing that's way in the past. Uh, you thinking about the here and now, you know reality right now, real time, real life. Something in real time, something in real life, you know, the ability to be in the present moment is a major component of mental wellness. So he's saying that you, um, the ability to be in the present moment is a major component of mental wellness. So you know that you are living in that, and you are living in that uh, state of mental wellness when you uh you have the ability to be present in the moment be present in the moment that way if you're present in the moment you can you can see things clearly in my opinion you can live in the moment be present in the moment present in the moment you can see things clearly you're not living you're not living uh you're living in the moment you're not living and thinking about things after it happened you know you're living in that moment in real time when something actually uh, happened, you know. The ability to be in the present moment is a major component of mental wellness. A musician must take music, an artist must paint. A poet must write if he is to be ultimately at peace with himself. A musician must make music, an artist must paint. Yeah, that's true, a musician must make music, like I was talking about in uh, my video yesterday, uh, the um, the genius of uh, Mozart and Beethoven. So when they make their music, so a musician must make music. And we have a lot of musicians today, you know, so those were just a couple that I talked about uh, in our past, um, Mozart and Beethoven. And here it says a musician must make music. That's true, an artist must paint, a poet must write. If he is to be ultimately at peace with himself. So in other words, I take this this quote to say from uh, Abraham Maslow to say that if you're a musician, then you know you do your you know your songs, your you know your chords, your, your singing, or whatever type of musician you are. You know, uh, you're a drummer, you're a guitar player, you're a singer. So in other words. Do what makes you happy. So if you're a musician, do what it, you know, do what you need to do. Do what you need to do as a musician. If you're an artist, you know, you want to paint, you want to draw, that makes you happy. So then you are at peace with yourself. 
And then it says a poet must write. A poet must write if he is to be ultimately at peace with himself. And then another, there's so many examples you can use for this quote right here. Um, you can be, uh, you know, you go to law school, you're a lawyer, so, and you finish law school, pass the bar, so, and then, you know, you out there practicing law, working for the court, or working for a big law firm, that, that, that gives you your peace, gives you your peace. Uh, like, um, then, you know, then somebody like me, you know, you, you went to, you know, I went to school for business, business administration, but other people, you know, you went to school for business administration, you out there, or business, you know, international business, business administration, you out there running your own business, or you're working for a corporation in the business department, uh, if that gives you peace, then, you know, so be it. And so many, you know, um, doctors, you go to school, you go to medical, medical school, and, you know, then you, um, you working at a hospital, you know, clinic or what, whatever, you know, wherever you want to work, you know, um, then uh, wherever gives you your peace. And also teachers, teachers, teachers go to school for, uh, uh, what's it, early childhood development. And then, you know, they, they in the schools teaching, you know, teaching kindergarten, first grade, second grade, doing what they love. So it says if, if a person uh, is basically doing what they love to do, that makes them ultimately, ultimately be at peace with themselves. So let me do one more. Excuse me. Uh, let's see. Uh, he says, uh, the story of the human race is the story of men and women selling themselves short. The story of the human race is the story of men and women selling themselves short. So I assume, I assume that he's saying that to the story of the human race. So, I mean, the human race I mean, sometimes we sometimes we do sell ourselves short. I do believe sometimes we sell ourselves short, and we uh, we can we can't you know we can't we can do things, but sometimes we we do sell ourselves short. Sometimes, but I've seen instances where people sell themselves short, and I have done the same. Uh, so the story of the human race is the story of men and women selling themselves short. Yeah, sometimes I can I can believe this quote. Because sometimes we sell ourselves short and sometimes we, uh, we are capable of doing more than we do, more than we think we could do, you know. So we sell ourselves short. We, a lot of us sell ourselves short a lot of times, you know, all, most of the times, you know. The story of the human race. So we all humans, you know, different races, different uh, ethnic groups. So a lot of times in 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 each in each of these uh, in any basically I would say in any of these ethnic ethnic groups uh, in these different you know these different ethnic groups we we all tend to sometimes sell ourselves short sell ourselves short so let me see okay here we go one more it's the last one marriage is a school marriage is a school itself also having children becoming a father changed my whole life it taught me as if it taught me as if by revelation so in other words marriage is a school within itself yep so i believe when he's saying marriage is a school marriage is a school itself because school is where you learn so basically in society uh out in society in different environments and different communities we all learn from each other Marriage is a school in itself, cause when you when you marry to somebody, you you still learning, you still learning them, because sometimes people say, well, I've been with them, I've been with this person five years, we want to get married. I've been with this person ten years, we want to get married. But I think learning is a never-ending process. Even after you get married, you still learning your spouse, you still learning your mate, you're learning each other. Sometimes you can marry somebody. <laughs> And they can change. They can start, they can, you know, when you first met them and you got married, they did things one way. And then after you got married, they started, they started doing things a different way. You're like, wait a minute now. I thought you, you know what? <laughs> so, uh, but, so marriage is a school. Marriage is a school itself. Also having children, that's school. That's a school you're learning. I mean, then your kids and you, you're learning from each other. 
You learn it from your spouse. Your spouse learns it from you. You learn it from your kids as they get older when you have a newborn. When you have a newborn, as that child gets older, older, you learn it from each other. He's changing. He's growing. He's, uh, you know, doing things differently, you know. And then, you know, you are doing things differently. And then a lot of times when we have our kids, we, um, we change definitely because it's a difference. In other words, just imagine before we had our kids, we, uh, we was doing things differently, maybe acting, we, you know, acting differently. And sometimes our ethical behavior, moral behavior changes when we have kids. So that's what I say, marriage is a school in itself. Also having children, that's a school. So it's all a learning process. Learning is never any process, I always say it. Becoming a father changed my whole life. So that's what the quote says. So become, that's what I'm saying. Becoming a father, becoming a mother. It changes, it changes us, you know, because we're so used to uh, being by ourselves. Just imagine, I was thinking when I... When I first got married, I mean, you know, I had a couple kids after, but then you, you know, life seems different. You seem like you, you, you become more aware. You, you think of life as being, you know, I mean, I guess, I guess you would, you know, it's just like once you have kids, it's just like you, you do see things differently, and you be more aware, and and you, you don't trust, you know, your trust level is, you know, your trust level went up. And it's just so many things that happen to you when you get married and you have kids. You say like you're just a whole different person from you're not just a single person no more with a without a you know carrying a, a, a worry or a, a care in the world, you know. So in other words, you know, when you're single and you run into the clubs and parties and all that, but then, you know, when you get married, you say like you're a different person, you got married, you had kids. So nine times out of nine times when you get married, nine times out of ten. Sometimes we tend to put our mate before us. We put our mate before us. We put our kids before us. So, you know, and then it's just a whole new, uh, it's just a whole new way of, we have, well, you have a whole new way of looking at things. You have, you have a whole new way of looking at life, yourself, your family. And so that is a, uh, uh, Abraham Maslow. Let's go to uh, Douglas McGregor. So Douglas McGregor proposed two distinct views of human beings. One basically, one basically negative labeled theory X, uh, and the other basically positive labeled theory Y. Uh, after viewing the way in which managers dealt with employees, McGregor concluded that a manager's view of the nature of human beings is based on a certain grouping of assumptions and that he or she tends to mold his or her behavior towards subordinates according to those assumptions. According to uh, Theory X, the four assumptions held by managers are as follows. Employees inherently dis dislike work and whenever possible will attempt to avoid it. Since employees dislike work, they must be coerced, controlled, or threatened with punishment to achieve goals. Employees will avoid responsibilities and seek formal direction uh, whenever possible. Most workers place security above all other factors associated with work and will display little ambition. So this is uh, Douglas McGregor, and he says uh, he proposed two distinct views of human beings. So Douglas McGregor, he um, was talking about uh, these two distinct views of humans. So in other words, we have when we go to work, when we go to work, some employees, some of us employees, you know, human employees, that's what they call, we are humans, but we, and when we go to work, we are, and we are the employees. Some of us go to work, we don't like our job. So that's what he's saying, Douglas McGregor. He said, according to Theory X, the four assumptions. So these are assumptions made by managers. So managers just, you know, they're assuming. So in other words, you're a manager, and you have five, six employees working under you. So your assumption may be, according to Douglas McGregor, managers assume certain things about the employees. And I say, you never even thought about nothing like that. They, the managers be thinking like, you know what? 
they come to work, they don't want, they can be in their mind, they can be like, they come to work, they act like they don't even want to work. They act like they don't even like the manager. They, uh, you know, they, they act like they don't even want to deal with no customers today. So, you know, things, things like that. Because it said, according to theory, X, the four assumptions held by managers are as follows. So these are just assumptions held by managers. Uh, employees inherently dislike work. And whenever possible, we attempt to avoid it. See what I'm saying? Come to work, don't want to do your job. Uh, since employees dislike work, they must be coerced, controlled, or threatened with punishment to achieve goals. So this, these are just some assumptions. And uh, employees will avoid responsibilities and seek formal direction uh, whenever possible. There's just some negativity about these employees. Most workers place security above all other factors associated with work and will display little ambition. And then in contrast to these negative views, as I said, about the nature of human be uh, being, the nature of human being. Some people go to work, some people love their job and they don't, you know, but this is Douglas McGregor. He just giving out the, you know, the assumptions that managers have. I guess I would say some of their employees, because when I am, when I was, when I had my job in certain places, I, I love to go to work. I go to work through my job. Uh, in contrast to these negative views about the nature of human beings, McGregor listed four positive assumptions. So he had negative assumptions, with, which were uh, negative assumptions, which was the theory X, and the positive assumptions is the theory Y. So in other words, the, part, the negative one was employees didn't like their work. And uh, since the employees didn't like their work, they must be coerced. In other words, you got to force them to do their job. But the positive side, the theory why, the employees can view, view work as being as natural as rest or play. People will exercise self-direction. In other words, they do things on their own. Self-direction, self-control, if they are committed to the objectives. The average person can learn to accept, even seek responsibility. So theory why they don't mind, you know, they don't mind going to work. They don't mind seeking responsibility and they view work as being, uh, you know, being natural. They go to work as a natural. I go to work, I do my job. And the, the last one, number four, the ability to make innovative decisions is widely dispersed throughout, throughout the population and is not necessarily the sole province of those in management positions. So the ability to make innovative uh, decisions is widely uh, dispersed throughout the population and is not necessarily the sole province of those uh, in management positions. What are the motivational implications? If you accept McGregor's uh, analysis, the answer is best expressed in the framework presented by Maslow, uh, Abraham Maslow, the theory X. It says theory X assumes that law Lower order needs dominate individuals. This is Abraham Maslow. So uh, theory X assumes that law order needs dominate individuals. Theory Y assumes that higher order needs dominate individuals. McGregor himself held to the belief that theory Y assumptions uh, were more valid than theory X. So in other words, theory X, so these are just the, um, this is just the hierarchy of, uh, in other words, managers, you know, according to McGregor, Douglas McGregor, these are just uh, the hierarchy of, uh, you know, high, I wouldn't say needs, but this is just a hierarchy. I guess I would say assumptions. These are the hierarchy of assumptions, hierarchy of assumptions, in other words, theory X and theory Y, Douglas McGregor. So let me see if he has any quotes. It says, and uh, also, uh, McGregor himself held to the belief that theory Y assumptions were more valid than theory X. Theory Y is, was, he, he felt that theory Y was more uh, valid than theory X. Right, right, okay, so no, well, for theory, theory Y was saying that employees don't mind going to work and doing a job. But theory X, Theory X, you said that employees dislike their job, they go to work, they don't want to work. 
You got to coerce them, force them to do their job. That's Theory X. And that's Douglas McGregor. Theory Y. So in other words, Douglas McGregor, he's saying that uh, he believes more in Theory Y, you know. So he's saying that uh, Theory Y assumptions were more valid. He felt that Theory Y assumptions were more valid than Theory X. Of course, because you can't say, you can't just say, you know, People go to work, you know, you can't, I mean, what, what is the, they didn't say nothing about no percentage, but what percentage are you talking about uh, when it comes to employees going to work, don't want to do their job? A lot of employees, a lot of employees go to work and they love their job. I mean, you might have some people out there, I mean, this book was written some years ago, over, you know, five, ten years ago, maybe. But, you know, so some people, I mean, it may be still some people out there that don't want to go to work, you know. I mean, don't want to go to work when you, when you get there. You know, sometimes you might not want to go to work, but once you get there, then you might be feeling a different way. You might be like, oh, yeah, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be here. So let me see if you had any quotes. Douglas McGregor. Let's see how you spell his name. M.C. M-C-G-I-E-R-U-R. Douglas McGregor, let me just read a couple quotes and I'm going to move on. Douglas McGregor, well, his name was Douglas Abbott McGregor, born January the 4th, 1953. January the 4th, 1953 is a retired U.S. Army Colonel and government official and an author, consultant, and television commentator. He played a significant role on the battlefield in the 1990s to 1991 Gulf War and the 1999 NATO bombing of Yugoslavia. His 1997 book, Breaking the Breaking the Phalanx, Phalanx, let me click. So in other words, his book, his 1997 book. So he's still around, he's still around, because he was born January the 4th, 1953. Uh, his 1997 book, Breaking the uh, Phalanx, established him as an influential in if unconventional theories of military strategy. His thinking contributed to the U.S. strategy in his 2003 invasion of Iraq. Uh, After leaving the military in 2004, he became more politically active. In 2020, uh, President Donald Trump proposed McGregor as ambassador to Germany, but the Senate blocked the nomination. On November 11, 2020, a Pentagon spokesperson uh, announced that McGregor had been hired to serve as senior advisor to the acting Secretary of Defense. It says, a post he held for less than three months. Trump also appointed him to the board of West Point Academy, his alma mater. These appointments proved controversial, controversial due to his history of racist comments. He regularly contributes uh, to Fox News where his opinions on Russia have caused controversy. So his early, so uh, Douglas Abbott, Abbott McGregor. Early life and education. He was educated at the uh, Penn Charter School in Philadelphia and at the Virginia Military Institute. He grad and graduated from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point with a B.S. Bachelor of Science degree in uh, General Engineering in 1976. He received his Ph.D. from the University of Virginia in International Relations in 1987. Okay, so let, let me see if we have any quotes. So, in other words, uh, it's also said uh, military career. He was in the military. McGregor was a was a squadron operations officer who uh, essentially directed the Battle of seventy three Easting during the Gulf War, facing facing an Iraq Republican Guard opponent opponent opponent. He he led a contingent consisting of nineteen tanks. 26 Bradley fighting vehicles and four M M1064 uh, mortar carriers. 
through the sandstorms to the 70 to the 73rd easting at roughly 16 18 hours on on the 26th of February 1991 uh, that destroyed almost 70 hour Iraq armored vehicles with no US casualties in a 23 minute span of the battle he was at the front of the formation in the center with Eagle uh, with Eagle Troop on the right and Ghost Troop on the left, McGregor designated Eagle Troop the main attack and positioned himself to the left of Eagle Troop. Eagle Troop scouts subsequently followed McGregor's tank through a minefield during which his crew destroyed two enemy tanks. So I'm not gonna read all this. Let me see what quotes he has. He has. Let me see what quotes he has. Okay, let me see, uh, Douglas next. Oh, yeah, this side quotes. Let me see if he have, let me see a few little quotes from him. Images, uh, okay, our goal should be minimum standard, standard, standardization. Uh, of human behavior, uh, Douglas McGregor, an objective without a plan is a dream. An objective without a plan is a dream. I can understand that. So in other words, uh, if you have an objective, uh, you don't have a plan for it, you don't have a strategy, then it's just a dream. In other words, you, you have an objective, so in order to carry out that objective, that plan, that idea, in order to carry out that objective, you have to have a plan, a strategy. So it's just a dream. It just uh, is is a, is a, it is an objective. It's just an idea. It's just uh, something that you thought about, you know, but you didn't create a plan for it. Uh, let me see what else he said. Our goal should be minimum standardization. I just read that one of human behavior and objective. Okay. I only see, oh, okay, he got some other, he got another one. Man lives that, man lives by bread alone when there is no bread. Man lives by bread alone when there is no bread. I don't quite understand that one. So how you gonna live by bread alone if you don't have no bread? So, uh, man lives by bread. I don't know if he's talking about money or bread. When you know, when you, know, you eat bread. Man lives by bread alone when there is no bread. So I guess he's just saying that you, if you just have bread, I assume, I don't know, if you just have bread, you can live, you can live off of just bread, I assume. Man lives by bread alone when there is no bread. So, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of, I have to <laughs> think about that one for real. I had to definitely think about that one. Let me see. Because man lives by bread alone when there's no bread. Let me read a couple more. Most teams aren't most teams aren't teams at all, but merely collections of individual relationships with the boss. Each individual uh, vying with the others for power, prestige, and position. So I can understand this one too. Most teams aren't teams at all, but merely collections of individual relationships with the boss. So in other words, they're not really a team. They're not a team. They're not working together to accomplish no particular goal. They just have an individual relationship with the boss. Yes, to be on the job, I guess, and get paid. Each individual vying with the others for power, prestige, and position. So I can understand that too, because some people sometimes when you're working on a job, this person might get a promotion. And the next person might might have might have felt that hey I uh, I should have gotten that promotion but he got it and they each fighting for power prestige position you know I should have gotten that position you know I've been here for ten years and I've been doing my job you know I've been doing my job you know much better than 
that lady over there, that gentleman over there, you know. So most teams aren't teams at all, but merely collections of individual relationships with the boss. So in other words, teams are supposed to work together collectively to achieve a goal. In other words, you're not really a team. You're just working there to just, you know, and, you know, just like a, not even a friendship with the boss, but just, just being, hey, how you doing, boss, when you come in in the morning, just getting by, you know, just get, coming to work and speaking to everybody and then just, you know, getting your paycheck at the end of the two-week period. So that's what he's saying. Most teams aren't teams at all. So most, that just, you can say the same thing about friends. Sometimes your friends, not even your friends. Sometimes your friends are not even your friends that you think, oh, yeah, you know, because you do things with them. You go to the club, you... Uh, you go shopping or you're talking to them on the phone a lot of times and you can say the same thing. Most friends aren't friends, but merely collections of, uh, individual relationships with each other, you know? So, uh, then I think there's one more that I have in the book and then I'm gonna go to my paper. Uh, so I have a gentleman named Hertz, Hertz Hertzberg. Motivation hygiene theory. We have the motivation hygiene theory, and that 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 was proposed by uh, physio physiologist Frederick Herzberg in the belief that an individual's relation to his or her work is a basic one, and that his or her attitude towards this work can very well determine the individual's success or failure. So he he felt that. Uh, an individual, when you go to work, your, you know, how you feel about your job has a lot to do with your future aspirations or how, uh, how you going to, uh, how you going to make it in life? How are you going to make it? So it says it, it's individual, an individual's relation to his or her work is a basic one and that his or her attitude toward this work can very well determine the individual's success or failure. So, how you feel about your job when you go to work? Do uh, you like your job? You like what you do? It can very well have something to do with have something to do with your success or failure. So, in other words, to me, he's saying that. In other words, what if you know you go to college and you you study something in particular, like uh, law, or business, or something like that? You know, and you go, you go to you go to work. But how you feel about that job? You went to school for, you know, you're working in the field that you went to school for. But when you get to when you get to your job, you really don't like the job. You don't like the people around you. You know, the the, the culture within the organization is not even a positive and ethical uh, culture cultural environment. You know, so in other words, that has a lot to do with you being able to make it in the future because you be like shoot. I come here every day, I went to school for this, but I'm really not liking this cultural environment that we have created within this organization. So that has a lot to do with uh, how you gonna, you know, how your future is gonna look. Some people's future not even looking bright, you know, and they on a job that they really just in a dead end job and they don't feel that it's bringing, a, it's bringing their mental health down because he's saying that in the belief that an individual's relation to his or her work. So in other words, when you go to work, you have a certain relationship with, uh, I guess, your job assignments, your boss, your, your co-workers. So sometimes you do build a bond, and sometimes you don't. So it says, Herzberg investigated a question, what do people want from their jobs? What do you want from your job? You want to feel... You want to feel wanted, you want to feel needed, you want to feel appreciated. You know, when you go to work, you want to feel like, well, my work I do, I want to feel, I want to feel wanted, I want to feel needed, I want to feel uh, appreciated, I want to feel that I contribute, uh, I want to feel that I contribute to this, uh, to this business, to this organization. I want to feel that I am contributing, you know, First of all, I contribute my time. I contribute my time. Also, I want to be, I want to know that I contribute to the success of this organization. I don't just come to work. And, well, I mean, some people might say, well, I go to work, you know, 
And uh, I, you know, I have you know my coworkers. Um, I'm friendly with the boss. I'm friendly with my coworkers and everything. But I want to feel. Sometimes you still want to. You want to feel. You want to feel that you are contributing to the success of that organization. You know, I mean, I know they're making a. You know, they're making a profit. Uh, they may be obtaining customers, and you know. You know, potential customers. You want to try to obtain some potential customers. You already have. You might have regular customers. So you want to. Uh, you definitely want to feel you that you're needed. And it says, um, first bird investigator question: What do people want from their job? So we all have to ask ourselves, what ourselves, what do we want from our job? We ask people to describe in detail when they feel exceptionally good and bad about their jobs. So he wanted people to describe in detail situations when they felt exceptionally good and bad about their jobs. Let me see if he has any quotes. So Douglas McGregor, Douglas McGregor, uh, let me see, I think there's a quote right here, let me see. Uh, let me see if you have any other, any other quotes. Okay, it says, uh, relationships is a growing part of life, not, not life growing apart. So relationships, relationships are a growing part of life, not life, not life growing apart. Right, so relationships, I can understand that. Relationships, uh, definitely we all have different types of relationships. We have a relationship, well, it depends on what type of well, I mean, you, we have, we all, we have all types of relationships. You know, you have a relationship with your spouse, your, your teacher. I mean, well, you know, you wouldn't have one with your teacher, but you might have a, you might have a teacher-student relationship is what I'm saying. So you have that type of relationship. So he didn't say what kind. He just said, in other words, you should, in other words, in life, you should have a relationship you should, when you when you are in the, when you are in these relationships, that's he's saying that that is a growing part of life, not the other way around where it says not life growing apart. That's the second part. So in other words, you don't want to be in a relationship that is, that that you you know that makes you go apart from that person that you are in a relationship with. So relationship, uh, growing part of life. Not life growing apart. So in other words, you don't want to grow life apart. You don't want to grow. You don't want to grow apart from life. You want to grow in your relationship. So uh, let me see. I think that's the last one. So let me. So that that was uh, Douglas McGregor uh, and uh, Abraham Maslow. And Hersberg. So those three right there. So so uh, let me talk about. Let me see. I don't want to go into the uh, slavery situation yet. I want to talk a little bit more about that because I want to read some more on that. But let me talk about Confucius. Let me talk about Confucius. So I'm going to make this video short today, but thanks for joining me. So if you can subscribe below, comment below, and, um, you know, also if you can give me some ideas, give me some ideas on different topics, you might, you know, you might think that, you know, it's very interesting for me to discuss on my channel right here, uh, Shirley's channel, uh, chatter, uh, so let me see Confucius. Let me see. Let me read some quotes for Confucius. So let me see. Let's let's read some quotes for Confucius. Confucius was a Chinese philosopher and politician of the spring and autumn period who is, who is traditionally considered a paragon of Chinese sages. A Chinese philosopher. Confucius is teachings and philosophy underpin East Asian culture and society and remain influential across China and East Asia to this day. So to this day, Confucius considered himself a transmitter for the values 
of earlier periods. Let me see what else they saying. Confucius. Confucius biography teachings and facts. Uh, Confucius. Uh, he was born fifteen. He was born five fifty one. Uh, in Shandong, Shandong province in China. He died 479. China's most famous teacher, philosopher, and political theorist uh, whose ideas have profoundly influenced the civilizations of China and other East Asian countries. Confucius was born near the end of an era known in Chinese history. So Confucius, he was a Chinese And it says his home was in, in Lu, a regional state of eastern China. Uh, his home was in Lu, a regional state of eastern China in what is now central and southwestern Shandong province. Like other regional states at the time, uh, Lu was bound to an imperial, imperial court of, of Zhu dynasty through history, culture, family ties, Culture and family ties were stretched back to the dynasty's found, founding uh, when relatives of the Zhu uh, rulers were in, in fear as heads of the regional states and moral obligations. According to some reports, Confucius's early ancestors were the, were the Kongs from the state of Song, an aristocratic family that produced several eminent counselors for the Song rulers. And it says, uh, by the mid-7th century BCE, however, the family had lost political standing and most of its wealth and some of the Kongs, Confucius's great-grandfather being one, had relocated to the state of Lu. It says the state of Lu, L-U. So that is Confucius. Confucius was candid about his family background. He said, he said that because he was poor and from a lowly station. He could not enter government service as, easy, as easily as young men from prominent families, and so had to become skilled. So he had to become skilled in many, in many, many old things. Uh, he found employment first with the Jisun Jisun clan, a hereditary family whose principal members had for many decades served as chief counselor. Uh, counsel to the rulers of LU. A series of modest positions with the Jisons as keeper of granaries and livestock as district officer in the family's feudal domain led to more important appointments in the LU government, first as Minister of Works and then as Minister of Crime. Records of the time suggest that a minister as Minister of Crime Confucius was effective in handling problems of law and order, but was even more impressive in diplomatic assignments. He always made sure that the ruler and his mission were well prepared for the unexpected and for situations that might put them in harm's way. He also knew how to advise them to bring a difficult negoti negotiation to a successful conclusion. Yet he held his office for only a few years. His resignation was a result of a protracted struggle with the hereditary families which for generations had been trying to wrestle uh, power away from the legitimate rulers of LU. Confucius, Confucius found the actions of the families transgressive and their ritual indiscretions objectionable and he was willing to fight by fair means or found to have the power of the ruler restored. So he was willing to fight by any means by any means, he was. He said he was. He, he was willing to fight fair, or he was willing to fight foul, uh, to have the power of the ruler restored. So uh, I guess that's enough. And you can read more up on Confucius. You can read more up on Confucius. Uh, he was a Chinese philosopher. Confucius, Chinese philosopher. So let's go to Rene Descartes. Let's see what he's talking about. 
Renee the Cartes. And I think I'm only going to do a couple more after that. And then I'm going to make this video short. Renee the Cartes. Dad's Cartes. Uh, so Renee this Cartes. Renee this Cartes. I, I might have did him before, but. So it says Renee the Cartes. Uh, let me see. Let's go click on philosophy. He was born March 31st, 1596. Uh, died February 11th, 1650. Uh, he was a French mathematician, scientist, and philosopher. So because he was one of the first to abandon <coughs> scholastic uh, Aristotelism, because he formulated the first modern version of mind-body dualism, from which stems the mind-body problem, and because he promoted the de development of a new science, grounded in observation and experiment, he is generally regarded as the founder of modern philosophy. So Rene Descartes, Descartes, the founder of modern philosophy. So philosophers, a lot of times they they give their views, in other words, uh, they philosophize, they give their views on different things. So he was known as, uh, regarded as, he was regarded as the founder of modern philosophy, apply, applying an original system of uh, method, 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 methodical, methodical doubt. He dismissed the apparent knowledge derived from authority the senses and reason and erected new epi epist epistemic foundation excuse me on the basis of the intuition that when he is thinking he exists this he expressed uh in the dic in the dictum i think therefore i am so let's rename this cartes he said i think that's one of his quotes i think therefore i am so in other, words, in other words, you think you think that you are beautiful, then you are beautiful. You think you're smart, then you're smart. I think, therefore, I am. Rene Descartes. Best known in its Latin formulation, called Car Gito Ergo Sum. Though originally written in French, uh, that phrase, and said he developed a metaphysical dualism that distinguishes radical Radical, that distinguishes radically between mind, uh, the essence of which is thinking and matter, the essence of which is extension in three dimensions. Descart Descartes' metaphysics is rationalist based on the postulation of innate uh, ideas of mind, matter, and God. Mind, matter, and God. But his physics and and physiology, physiology based on sensory experience are me mechanistic and empiricist. So Rene Descartes, so you can read up a little bit more on them, him if you want to. <clears throat> Let's go to Charles Darwin. Let's go to Charles Darwin and his theory of evolution. Charles Darwin was a British biologist. British biologist. So, Charles Darwin, and I think I'm going to do one more, and then I'll do another video maybe tomorrow. So, Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin in full, in full, his name was Charles Robert Darwin, born February 12, 1809. Uh, he was an English naturalist whose scientific theory of evolution by natural selection became the foundation of modern evolutionary studies. An affable country gentleman, Darwin, at first shocked religious Victorian society by suggesting that animals and humans shared a common ancestry. 
or however his non-religious biology appealed to the rising class of professional scientists and by the time of his death, evolutionary imaginary, imagery or imagery, imagery had spread through all of science, literature and politics. I'm just butchering these words. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, y'all. Uh, it says uh, Darwin, him, Darwin himself and agnostic was accorded the ultimate British accolade, accolade <laughs> of burial in Westminster Abbey. Darwin formulated his bold theory in private, uh, in private, 1837 to 1839. After returning from a voyage around the world aboard the HMS Beagle. So he went on a voyage around the world uh, in the HMS Beagle, voyage around the world, but it was not until two decades later that he finally gave it full public expression on the origin of species, 1859, a book that has deeply influenced modern Western society and thought. And I, I have that book. Darwin was the second son of, of society, Dr. Robert Waring Darwin, and of Susanna Wedgwood, daughter of the Unitarian pottery industrialist, Josiah Wedgwood. 